people's identities have so much more to do with marketing than you probably think. If you're dealing with somebody who has more of a fixed mindset, so they believe that personality traits are and ability to learn and things like that are set in stone, by having kind of messaging that allows them to show their worth. What's up, aspiring CMOs? Today, I'm going to interview a boss lady, Sarah Presh, the chief marketing officer of Dragon Metrics. We will explore why is it important to look beyond the numbers and put a little bit of psychology into your marketing campaigns so you can make a big difference. She will also share with us the whole journey of going from a big corporate role as a marketing director and to lead your own agency as a boss lady and eventually to go back to startup world, restart the whole marketing department all over again with all the experience that she have gone through over the many years of being a CMO. Understanding different search engines um, and just, you know, not setting realistic APIs and not realizing that, you no, know, you ha even though you're a big brand where you are, you have to start from the bottom and you have to, you know, gain your trust. And she will give us hands-on examples and tips how to get started with this consumer psychology and what are the things you need to look into in order to make a very cool decision on your marketing campaign. If you're ready to level up your marketing skills, Let's get into the episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Aspiring CMO Podcast. Today, I have Sarah with me. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Um, awesome. I'm super excited that you're here because you have a lot of interesting things to share, specifically about marketing psychology like or consumer psychology in general. Now, a um, bit of background. When I heard this term for the first time, I was in university. I uh, The last thing I wanted to do on earth was studying. So, And I was like, this consumer psychology sounds interesting, but the course was not mm -mm, it was not fun it was just not fun at all but I'm, I'm so happy to relearn this concept from you today but before we dive in could you introduce yourself yeah sure one thing I can totally relate to courses not being so interesting I'm gonna speak at a conference in, in two months time in Barcelona about something that I absolutely hated during my degree so quite interesting <laughs> um, but anyway you can turn something around and like it um, yeah so anyway hi I'm Sarah um, I'm the digital marketing director at an SEO tool called Dragon Metrics and I basically to put it simply I'm not the most interesting person but I absolutely love combining my background in psychology with marketing and you know doing things like consumer psychology psycho marketing as I like to call it um, and just you know looking at SEO and marketing from a slightly different perspective. I love it so much interesting thing going on and uh, just a topic when I first saw you in Zagreb I was like oh I want to sit and I want to listen. Um, when was the first case study or like one, one of your first memories that you can recall in your career where you were like, yo, this psychology thing, I have to use this in my marketing campaign. What was the first campaign or anything that you can recall where you made that connection? It was pretty recent, actually. So it was about two, three years, two years ago, um, I think. Yeah, about two years ago, maybe three now, um, when I was kind of going through a phase where I didn't know what to do with my degree. I went back and studied later um, as a mature student. So I was like, oh, my gosh, do I follow the route and become a doctor of clinical psychology, which is going to take me another seven years and I'll be in my 40s when I finish? Or do I, you know, try and make the best of what I've got and mix marketing with um, psychology? So I had a presentation coming up on international SEO because that's what I used to do and what I used to work in. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, this actually fits with some of the stuff that we were doing about, you know, identity and personality and, you know, psychology of kind of like cultural stuff and cultural relations and things like that. And I was like, this really mixes in. So I decided that I would try it um I ended up presenting at Brighton SEO on a topic like that and it went down really really well and then from then ever since I've kind of just been able to look at psychology and look at marketing and just find ways that they overlap because like at college they don't teach you kind of psychology and marketing in a psychology degree it's something that you have to take something completely different and marketing and then try and find ways that they merge and it's so fun trying to do that yeah so um in, as an SEO because you are working in SEO SEO tool. So do you, does that consumer psychology like mostly translate in to how you got to develop the tool or is it like how you build your campaign? What I think like someone who is not really knowledgeable in this topic, right? Like most listeners, like I'm thinking of like colors or like, cause, mm. or, or some certain words in the tagline, but from your 
professional view, how do you kind of translate that in, into your day to day marketing life? So there's a couple of ways that you do it. So like I'm an SEO, I've been working in SEO for like 12 years or so. So there's a campaign side of things where quite a lot of people don't realize that psychology has a lot to do with the campaigns because, you know, when we're trying to get people to convert, we need to understand how they think and what motivates them because, you know, people are not sitting rationally at a keyboard and going, oh, today I'm going to look for a nice book that I'm going to buy and I'm going to, you know, go through the optimal, you know, path to purchase and stuff like that. It's slightly different. Um, So understanding people's motivations and what's going on. And for me, I absolutely love social psychology. So understanding kind of the social side of things and, you know, how people behave in groups and how people, you know, form their identities and how that kind of, you have to play to that when you create content and stuff like that. That's one side of thing. And then when it comes to the tool, so I'm always annoying my boss with certain little things of like, why don't we do it like that? Because, you know, that will contribute to that bias and then people will do it this way. Or why don't we do the content this way or something like that? So I didn't think that I would ever use psychology to kind of, you know, build parts of the tool, but sometimes it works. Could you like give us like a tactic? What is that one little thing that where consumer psychology plays into some sort of marketing decision? There's a couple. I I would say that, you know, my favorite theory is probably social learning theory and maybe social identity theory. And it's one that's actually come up in multiple talks that I've done. And social identity theory is where people kind of base their identities based on the groups that they belong to and the kind of people that they hang out with. Um, And that in turn kind of leads to, you know, a sense of self-worth. And then if, for example, you know, they belong to a certain group that maybe doesn't like other people or stuff like that, it's kind of interesting because that's where the roots of things like racism and discrimination come in um, because of things like that. So for me, understanding kind of people's motivations a little bit like that and how, you know, people's identities have so much more to do with marketing than you probably think. I would say definitely read up on social identity theory um, and, you know, take that into account. Like, it's not generally related to marketing whatsoever, but it's a good thing to understand and to understand how people function, especially in groups and as marketers we're always targeting groups of people like demographics and stuff like that. So in a social identity, you are thinking of uh, race, age, country? It could be anything. So like when people break themselves down into identities, it could be, for example, the town that they come from. It could be race. It could be, like you said, um, you know, sexual orientation, religion. But then it goes as simple as, for example, if you prefer, you know, a certain washing powder to another or, you know, with makeup, if, for example, you're of a Mac person or more of an urban decay kind of person like those sort of things form your identities even if they seem little so like if for example you're a makeup brand and you're trying to target people who are say only using mac and really you know dedicated to that brand you've got to work harder because you've got to try and you know compare your product to them and the fact that say you know it's got really good um cover and it lasts long and it feels light and stuff like that. Um, so it helps you understand kind of pain points and things like that. Hi, if you listened to this far, thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the show, please leave me a review on either Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or my YouTube channel. If you have any feedback for the show, please let me know on the Aspiring CMO Podcast social media pages on Facebook and Instagram, or send me an email on my website. Now let's get back to the episode. When you start a brand, so from some people start, like many, many people start brands from scratch and they want to say like you know what this is my ideal target audience and they put all these like um, assumptions oh they have to like this and they have to feel like this but when they start a company they often don't know which product is going to sell and how they're going to sell that to me has always been like it's a chicken and an egg kind of question so does that social identity come before or after you have launched a company or the or or product actually the same makeup I think to be honest you kind of have to have an idea before you launch and this is where I will say that I really don't like demographics because I don't know if you've seen kind of the pictures going around of Ozzy Osbourne versus Prince Charles and stuff like that that they have exactly the same kind of demographics on paper but they're completely different people um so I prefer psycho um graphics so that's where you can look at you know people's personality traits and you know look at them from a psychological perspective 
perspective because if you start you know providing messaging to people based on their mindset or based on their personality traits and stuff like that rather than their age or where they come from um, you can actually have messaging that relates so much better or resonates with them so much better than you can with um, you know just doing your normal demographics that most business owners do yeah okay I think that makes sense to focus more on like psycho psychographics and for example let, let's just look at you're a marketing director at uh um, your SEO to Dragon Metrics. Yep. Um, what is the psychographic for for your company, for example, for your company's target audience? We have quite a wide target audience, but to be honest, um, you know, we're targeting SEOs a lot because they use SEO tools, and then you can break that down into different type of people. So you have, for example, the SEOs who are say more on the confidence side. Who I don't want to. Okay, I'm just going to be honest and say the SEOs who are overconfident and you know really scream and shout about their um, winnings and use you know um, screenshots of their SEO tools um, and then you also have for example SEOs who are say newer in their journey who are more shy and you can create messaging around that then you have enterprises who for example you know um, from a different I don't really know how to explain enterprises because again it depends on the enterprise that you're trying to target or the sort of enterprise because like small businesses and large businesses are going to be completely different but they all kind of you know group into SEOs who are say overconfident and you can map this to kind of like the big five personality theories and stuff like that okay so you are actually using like um personality tests to match your audience as well you can actually do that it's actually really interesting like there are some really um I would say more black cat ways of doing things you know like the if you've heard of the Cambridge Ana Analytica um yeah. you know scandal what they actually did was quite clever from a personality standpoint because they used um you know on Facebook when you used to have those quizzes of you know what Disney princess are you or what sort of personality do you have they use big five personality tests um um, to create these quizzes that people did and then they managed to you know target people's personalities based on kind of their social profiles and the likes that they have and things like that um so you can go really deep with that actually um but it's you know some people like it some people don't like it you know I think it depends on kind of what sort of your aims are and it's definitely more for a bigger business sort of thing who has the money and has the data um for people to do rather than small businesses who don't yeah, yeah. Uh, it's all about data collection too. Do you run any tests um, to to support uh, or in the past that to support some of the campaigns? So like find out uh, how these people react to something and then using that you would, I don't know, shape your uh, paid ad campaigns or social media campaigns or something? Yeah, so I've normally kind of done it based on normal metrics because I haven't worked for a big company who have done this en masse, but you can use it and test it out in, you know, medium-sized companies, um, smaller companies, um, I would say as well, kind of large companies because that's some of the ones that I've worked for as well. Um, but what you can do is kind of test out these different messaging. Um, so for example, um, if you're dealing with somebody who, okay, I'm going on a different tangent, but if you're dealing with somebody who has more of a fixed mindset, um, so they believe that personality traits are and ability to learn and things like that are set in stone by having kind of messaging that allows them to show their worth that sort of thing so um car brands and luxury brands are very good at doing this um because they're like with us you can become xyz whereas people with more of a growth mindset prefer learning so with us you can learn and become and put some effort in and do this um so you can just measure conversions and things like that so if for example you're getting more conversions with a certain messaging then you know that it's working and by understanding the psychographics of your audience you know that for example if you run a luxury car brand the people who are buying you are more people who kind of want to show off their status rather than people who would say a bit more modest yeah, yeah. i think that makes complete sense and uh, i love the examples how you uh broke it down into like fixed and growth mindset in that specific campaign um and now i also want to like ask you more as a cmo or marketing director like your day-to-day -day as uh it's perfect to to show us or like tell us like how does your day-to-day -day look like as a marketing director 
um yeah so for me I have a bit of a strange marketing director role because I kind of do a little bit of everything so you can actually find me doing demos with the software you can find me on live support sometimes um doing stuff like that um in my day-to-day actual marketing role you know I'm coming up with the strategies I'm coming up with the plans I am you know um running webinars and writing content and doing social media and basically everything that you'd expect from a marketing person you know running conferences speaking at conferences that sort of stuff um and because I'm the first marketing person that Dragon Metrics has actually hired because before that you know it was a team of developers who focused on creating a really good tool um I kind of had my work cut out to start from the beginning and actually get everything up and running which is a fun challenge and actually I really enjoy it that's awesome has it has it been has this been different um, CMO or marketing director role compared to your previous one I mean you've been in marketing for so long like you said 12 years so mm. how's that how's your role different now how has it changed oh it's totally different I think to be honest the role that I'm in now is a bit special because it's not like any of the other director roles that I've done because normally I wouldn't you know get my I'd get my hands dirty and you know do life support and customer service stuff and things like that in my last role for example when I was an SEO director international SEO director um what I was doing is I was doing more cons- consultation so I was working with large companies fortune 100 companies and helping them you know expand abroad helping them deal with their um, content um, in different languages and kind of being more like a cultural consultant so I did a lot of work with for example Baidu in China and explaining to people you know about the marketing landscape in China being so different to it as in the West Um, and just you know having a deep cultural knowledge of different countries and how they work and working with the international team so that you know I can make sure that I understood everything correctly and you know gave the right advice Um, and then I decided to move into more of a digital marketing director role because I'll be honest I kind of got bored with international SEO so I moved into a digital marketing director role and again that was coming up with plans that was kind of go-to-market strategies that was you know creating um lots of things you know marketing plans making sure that they went ahead doing the measurements um that sort of thing so it was kind of less hands-on yeah yeah. um what so when you expanded to international market using seo which is international seo then um were you able to set up similar sops between every country or did you have to redo the whole um, marketing SOP from scratch each time you enter the new market? So when it came to entering new markets, I'm a big fan of kind of localizing absolutely everything. So coming up with local strategies, like there are countries where, for example, you can adapt what you already have, but you always have to do kind of competitive research. You always have to do, you know, research in the country. You have to kind of understand the cultural um, differences between the different countries um, in order to, you know, market like a local really. Um, so, you know, I would, I'm always a big fan of adapting um and coming up with different plans and also with kpis lots of people i see a big mistake that lots of people do is that they say come from america they're going into say the czech republic which has a population of 10 million so we're um, a lot smaller country and like why are the search volumes so different? This is a bad keyword because the search volumes are lower. And whereas like from a check standpoint is a really good one. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, understanding different search engines um, and just, you know, not setting realistic APIs and not realizing that, no, you ha- even though you're a big brand where you are, you have to start from the bottom and you have to, you know, gain your trust. And, you know, some of the competitors that you have in America are not going to be relevant in this country because you're going to have different competitors. That's awesome. How do you uh, find it yourself to like set different goals to teams? I think I quite struggle with that uh, still to to find out measurable and achievable goals for a team, for a marketing team. I think sometimes that is a little bit um, hard as well because like some things you can't measure. Um, but I always try to use kind of like digital marketing goals because everything with digital marketing you can measure. So trying to measure, you know, um, you know, you know, um, how many people kind of go to your website, the increase in conversions, you know, how many sales you get from a particular channel, that sort of thing. And as long as you see see things going up, then you know that you're doing well. And when it comes to like, you know, offline stuff like conferences as well, measuring um, the ROI, measuring the number of like demos and leads and stuff that you get um, from there and then revenue. Um, but again, that one's a little bit complicated because sometimes you meet somebody at a conference and they convert two years later. Um, so just making sure that you have have everything 
link set up correctly and you know salesforce or hubspot or whatever you're using so that you can mark those conversions and you know attribute it to different um you know marketing activities Mm -hmm. what is the most challenging thing you find in your marketing director role i think when it comes to marketing i think you know dealing with budgets is quite complicated because a lot a lot of times you have lots of ideas you know that you have a lot of potential but depending on the company that you work for the kind of budgets that you want is unrealistic so one of the challenges that I find myself up against now is, for example, I'm going up as a one person marketing team against companies which have like a 50 person marketing team. And even though our software is completely comparable and, you know, we even have our own set of unique features because I don't have the budget to, you know, pay influencers to do X, Y, Z, to create, you know, the latest courses and stuff like that. I'm having to adapt the way that I market to suit the budget. It's possible to do that, but you just have to think outside the box and try and find ways to collaborate with people. And I think it's, this is where relationships are really important because if you don't build the relationships, you can't go to somebody and be like, Hey, would you mind doing this for me? Or Hey, if I give you a free license, would you mind doing this for me? Sort of thing. 100%. Honestly. Yeah. Uh, okay. So budgeting and uh, seems like you are lonely in the team, right? Um, kind of reminds me of my first marketing job. Didn't last long, but I definitely learned a lot. But I find marketing to be a teamwork. Like it cannot be a, a solo person thing for a long time uh, in a sustainable way. Um, like just starting with like graphics and stuff. Like I cannot sit down and learn Photoshop and uh, and Canva can only do so much, I understand. Yep. Or even Illustrator, if you want to stand out, you have to make your own. I cannot do those stuff. And it's no. like, like, definitely like we need we need a team yeah yeah I'm really lucky that I kind of have support from some of the colleagues so like they'll step in and help me when it comes to you know like I want to update the website so I'll give it to the developer team and they'll help me do that and then if I want some graphics uh um, my boss is actually a really really good graphic designer because he designs a platform so I wow. can pass it over to him and say can you create this for me um and you know whenever I'm doing kind of different thing or marketing stuff that are more technical luckily I have the support and the training as well so that you know I wasn't the tech person before I started this role I had no idea like what happened behind the scenes in SEO tools I'll be honest but I wanted to learn something new and luckily I have that support and time to learn these different things so that helps a lot yeah yes how do you compare your marketing director role in a, a smaller company versus like a bigger company which one did you enjoy the most which one was like more challenging like for someone who is aspiring to be someone like you what what what's the advice you would give them how honest can I be can I be really honest? super honest really I, honest. I absolutely hate corporate marketing roles so I've done the big corporate thing because you know I thought that you know if you're going to be a successful marketer you have to do the big corporate thing and work for a big corporation and stuff like that I bloody hated it just because I hated wow. the um I just hated the politics that went alongside it because like instead of getting something done you always had to deal with somebody in a different department and then you had to deal with bitchy people and stuff like that you know what it's like corporate politics it's not easy to deal with um so for me when I step back from like working for a bigger company and went into my role now I'm actually loving it because you know we can get stuff done we don't have to go through kind of our like week-long month-long you know procurement processes and stuff like that I can just go and ask the boss and be like look I want to do this this is my vision I'm going to pitch this for you can we do it and it's either yes or no um so for aspiring marketers I would definitely say don't feel like you have to do the whole corporate thing if you don't want to try it out you know I'm totally up for people trying, you know, completely different roles, even going from like SEO to training into PPC or like I did going from international SEO to digital marketing director to, you know, working in a tool company. Um, But try different things and see what you like and then stick at it. Maybe you like the corporate kind of workflow and stuff like that. It wasn't for me. So I'm definitely going to stay at smaller companies from now on. And the most important thing that you can do is work on getting results. Having a CV with results in um, and a bit of a portfolio really makes a world of difference. And also as well, you know, I used to run my own agency. It was a very successful agency. We got quite a lot of 
awards but I realized it wasn't for me and if you do you know try a side gig or you do want to start off on your own one thing that I wish I knew back then was it's okay to go back to being an employee there's nothing wrong with it because I thought you know no one would hire me it would be a disaster you know people would think that I quit people would think that you know um, there's something wrong with me but actually my skills as a business owner are so valuable in my job because I understand you know financing I understand you know the legal side of things I understand why people have budgets and why they can't just give me you know xyz because I have an idea or I want to do this and test something out um which I think you know management do really appreciate I'm 100% with you and I think the last advice was more like a mindset advice people and myself included we always say oh what what if other people think about us yep. this way? And to be honest, nobody cares, right? Like, like we always put this mindset in us, like, oh, um, if I quit or if I stop doing this, people will judge me. But then, no, there's no judgment. And if they do judge you, they are shitty people. Let's just be honest, right? That's exactly it. Yeah. Like, I think LinkedIn was my worst enemy when I was back there because I didn't have the strong network that I had today. So I was seeing all of these wankery people on LinkedIn boasting about I made $10 million by doing X, Y, Z and by having cold showers and you can't quit. And actually this whole talk about hustle life actually kind of let me, I, I burnt out, um, to be honest, just from thinking that I had to hustle. And I was quite young when I set up my agency. So I genuinely, you know, thought that you had to do this. Um, but now that I spent time, you know, building my network, LinkedIn's quite a fun place to be. And you can see people's failures and you can see that people, um, you know, doing what I did was completely OK. And, you know, as you said, if people are going to judge you, if people are going to make you feel like shit, then find better people because they are out there. Exactly. Exactly. I love this. Um, I think you have shown us like a journey of from like doing one thing, but then becoming a CMO. So starting your business and like this, that is super, super valuable. Um, yeah, definitely. Like, I'll be honest. I, I had a child when I was a teenager. I started from nothing. I had to do my degree when my kids were older, you know. I worked from the bottom up. I used to, you know, work as a carer for old people and I used to work in Subway. And then I got my first job, you know, working in a small company and I worked, I got basically because I was good at marketing, they put me as a marketing manager and then I got head of marketing. Then I set up my own company and now I do what um, I do now. So even if you're looking at this from a, oh my gosh, I don't know where to start or, you know, it is, it is possible. You just got to put the work in and not be afraid to start from the bottom. Exactly. Exactly. One last question though, uh, if people want to start out learning like consumer psychology and just get the basics right, where should they start? I would definitely say be careful of the sources that you use because there's a lot of kind of pseudo psychology out there. Um, and there's a lot of people, for example, on LinkedIn who are very confident about their pseudo psychology and describe themselves as, you know, psychology marketers when actually it's not true. So I would say start reading books by people who actually have qualifications in psychology so for example um you know so many different different authors that you can take a look at you can also as well um google scholar is actually my place to go so when i'm preparing for conferences i always go to google scholar and look at the latest research and read research papers and then take the psychology research and blend it with marketing um and also don't really expect to find lots of decent marketing psychology books um, because, you know, psychology and marketing don't always mix. So you really have to kind of blend the two and be creative. And, you know, once you've read the um, psychology papers, lots of people will probably tell you, oh, you can't do that because you're not qualified or, you know, academia doesn't allow you to mix this with this. And there's quite a lot of snobbery around it but be creative read the research papers make sure that you can back up you know the studies that you're referencing mix it in with marketing and then you're ready to go so anybody can do that just as long as you're um, willing to read it yes amazing uh, thank you i think uh, i didn't even think about it to look at my resource or like the qualification of the author i would have just like blindly picked a book 
or pick a movie or an, a YouTube video. Oh, YouTube video is probably very dangerous in this case, right? Because anyone can make a YouTube video, make it super quick, baby. But um, those are not the people we should be listening to in this case, right? Definitely. And, you know, psychologists and people like that are not very good at marketing themselves because they're not marketers. So, you know, I've <laughs> I've had to kind of combine the two by being really creative and it works. Um it really does. Um, but yeah, I have got quite a bit of stick from, say, the academic psychology community for doing that because, you know, it's not the traditional way to go. Um, but I would say do it and, you know, don't be afraid to go outside the box and think of something creative. Amazing. Cool. Um, thank you so much for joining the podcast. But my last question, though, and it's always kind of the same for everyone, mm -hmm. is if you were to go back in time, what advice would you give for your younger self? Oh, gosh, the advice that I would give my younger self is probably just take your own route and don't feel pressured to do all of that wanky business stuff that you think that you have to do as a business owner. If you don't want to read business books, don't read business books. If you don't want to, you know, have a cold shower in the morning or wake up at six <laughs> o'clock, sleep until 10 in the morning, you know, work late in the evening, do what you want, just follow your own path and don't feel pressured to do anything just because other people say that it's good. Amazing. That's spot on. And thank you for sharing that. Um, if people would like to reach out to you, how can they find you? Yeah, so I am mainly on LinkedIn. Um, so you can find me on LinkedIn. And that's probably the easiest place to find me, actually. If you wanted to email me, my email is sarah.presh at dragonmetrics.com. Um, but yeah, I love talking to people. I love helping people as well with kind of their careers and mentorship as I used to be a university lecturer. So if you have any questions or want to learn or anything, come and get in touch with me and I'll be happy to help. Amazing. Thank you, Sarah, so much. And I will see you at the SEO Mastery Summit. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me yay awesome see you then bye